Good morning, and thank you for coming. My name is Leanne Sampadanasical, and today I'll be speaking to you about the work my team has done this past semester, stepping away from our traditionally environmental focus to look at the development aid sector. It is our hope, and the hope of our client, that what we've learned from development aid can be applied to the climate arena, and that coming up with fair and equitable practices can solve one piece of the puzzle for an international climate agreement. First, I'll speak a little bit about our client, the project, and our research question, as well as some definitions of equity and how our work fits into a broader context. Next, I'll talk about the methodology, the institutions we looked at, and the questions that guided our research. And finally, I'll address the lessons learned and findings for the climate regime. The client for our project is the World Resources Institute, who has entered into an agreement with the Mary Robinson Foundation to jointly pursue a climate justice dialogue. The goal of this dialogue is to bring issues of equity to a 2015 meeting of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, or the UNFCCC for short. The research question we were asked to address is what lessons about defining methods of equity and applying equity can the climate regime learn from aid arrangements? To answer this question, we must first define equity and examine how our work fits into a broader context. The climate regime often frames equity in terms of common but differentiated responsibilities, or CBDR. As you may know, climate negotiations have stalled due to the objection of what and how much historic responsibility a developed country, like the United States, should have versus a historically low emission country or a rapidly industrializing country like China. To refocus CBDR and move the conversation forward, our research question asks, how do other sectors put equity into practice? The Paris Declaration on Aid Effectiveness serves as a practical example of equity in development aid. This international agreement proposes a common framework for donor activities. The five principles of the declaration are project ownership by developing countries, alignment of donors with recipient country priorities, harmonization to reduce duplication of efforts, managing for results to develop more effective systems, and mutual accountability on the part of both donors and recipients. For our purposes, the Paris Declaration exemplifies the kind of specific equity principles that might help redefine CBDR, which will be a part of the UNFCCC negotiations in Paris 2015 to ratify a new climate agreement. In our research methodology, we focused on three types of aid organizations. The first type were multilateral financial institutions, including the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, and the Inter-American and Asian Development Banks. The second group were other multilateral institutions like the United Nations Development Program and the European Union Cohesion Policy. And the third group was a sampling of national aid agencies comprised of CETA from Sweden, USAID from the United States, and DFID from the United Kingdom. To each of these organizations, we applied our research framework and asked questions like, how do these organizations receive funds and how do they decide who gets funds? Are there strings attached, or do only certain countries or projects get funding? How equitable or fair the allocation processes are was a critical part of the research. We asked, how is aid given in terms of country eligibility, generation of funds, accountability, and transparency? We also supplemented our research with interviews of those currently or previously working at these institutions, and finally, drew lessons from our collective research. In fact, one of the major challenges in the process was taking the individual research from nine different agencies and identifying the commonalities. Another challenge was in the interview stage, both in establishing contact with interviewees and receiving unbiased feedback of the agencies they serve. And it was critical to methodically apply the research framework as equity was not always treated as a separate issue, but rather integrated into each organization's work. So what lessons did we discover? One of the overarching themes we found was that organizations struggled to find a balance between providing a structured method of funding and allowing for flexibility. To standardize who receives aid, one of the tools used includes formulas based on a particular GDP or GNI level per capita. This method attempts to ensure equity by excluding country, countries that are economically well off and don't need aid. Because not all countries develop at the same rates, 
The World Bank and the regional banks have multiple GNI levels as part of their graduation policies. The Republic of Korea is one example of a country that started out receiving extremely low interest rate loans from the Asian Development Bank, progressed to higher market interest rate loans, and finally graduated from regular aid assistance altogether. Another way to introduce flexibility could be taking into account fragile states that are vulnerable to social, political, or economic instability. In this way, exceptions can be made for specific country situations. Of course, it should be noted that uh, flexibility in practice isn't always done correctly, and there's plenty of criticism when a country is graduated from aid too quickly or encouraged to take on new loans it may have trouble repaying. Other tools used include a regional approach to better target resource allocation. The EU cohesion policy makes funding available for needy subnational areas that might ha not have received funding if their country was evaluated on a national level. Other tools include results-based management approaches as well as untying aid so that the focus remains on assisting the developing country, not having the donor country profit from giving aid. Conditionality can be detrimental, like tied aid, or beneficial when used to ensure accountability of funds and decrease corruption. So how can these lessons be applied to the climate regime? In our research, we found that since the adoption of the Paris Declaration principles, organizations have undergone a shift both in their operations and their frame of mind to better align themselves with equitable practices. Using these principles might shift the concept of CBDR away from blame or culpability to focus more on partnership, ownership, and mutual accountability. That, that way, all nations have incentives to engage in climate mitigation and adaptation activities. Establishing predictable yet flexible methods for climate financing can also be met using the strategies mentioned earlier. There are many variations possible with these tools. For example, using a subnational or regional approach could acknowledge that all nations, large and small emitters alike, are responsible for and affected by climate change. Things aren't so black and white as polluters and non-polluters, and giving voice to those nuances could encourage participation from countries that have traditionally avoided addressing climate issues. There's also a value in country assessment tools used by agencies like the World Bank and the UNDP. These assessments ask needs, nations in need of assistance what their national priorities are so that donors can align their efforts with the adaptation and mitigation needs of the recipient country. And lastly, the private sector should be engaged cautiously. It's best at addressing risk and increasing innovation, so it might be well suited for a mitigation effort like a solar panel pilot project but an adaptation project might not be very entrepreneurial and not well suited for the private sector. These are but a few tools and applications for the climate regime taken from existing practices and the development aid arena. There's a lot to be learned from the Paris Declaration principles, and there's a lot to be learned from the successes and failures of the agencies discussed today. By transferring methods from the aid sector to the climate sector, we can redefine our common but differentiated responsibilities, reuse practical tools for success, and ultimately take part in a process to re-stimulate international climate agreements that all nations can be committed to. Thank you, and I'll take any questions.